Facilities that make this program possible are provided by the City of Highland Park and have been made possible in part by Ravinia Festival, CJE Senior Life, Gand Music and Sound. Conman's Current Events Roundtable. Today we're bringing back one of my favorite guests coming all the way from Florida is Michael Zanto, our foreign political analyst. Again, Michael, welcome back to Conman's Roundtable. It's always a pleasure. And it's always a pleasure to have you. Thank you very much. Um, we're going to be talking today about Israel, the regional superpower. And I'd like to read something that is a quote from Israeli's Prime Minister Golda Meir. She said that Moses led the children of Israel for 40 years of wandering in the desert until he found the only place in the Middle East where there wasn't any oil. But could Moses have been any smarter than believed? Apparently, the Canadians and Russians think so, as both countries are moving to step up energy relations with a tiny nation whose total energy reserves some experts now think could rival or even surpass the fabled oil wealth of Saudi Arabia. Imagine that. Israel's strong economy technological prowess, military strength, and relationship with the United States has put it in a league apart from its Arab adversaries. Michael, what do you think about that? Remember, everybody said that Israel was, you know, was the only country in the Middle East without any oil, and therefore, what happened? How well, you know, it's happen? interesting. So there's an $80 billion discovery, or two discoveries, actually, at least, in the, in the Mediterranean of natural gas in Israel. There's other resources that Israel could tap into, but it is an issue that we're kind of almost in a post-oil age in the sense that there's a glut of oil in the market right now. Oil prices are dropping. So the real precious commodity is Israel's intellectual capital, the educated, intelligent people. So I think what a reversal we've gone through. In the early 80s, the Israeli economy had hyperinflation, struggling government mm -hmm. finances, a legacy of a kind of socialist government. It needed the U.S. Congress help to, with its finances. And then, in the late, uh, and then later in the 90s, it had a flood of Jews from the former Soviet Union, and it didn't have the economic resources to absorb it. There were uh, Russians with PhDs who found themselves actually... Um, sweeping notoriously. And so the story was they couldn't absorb the Russians. Well, today Israel is a technological colossus. It was overtaken by the Chinese for a number of companies listed on U.S. stock markets, but barely. Mm -hmm. And China obviously has more than a billion people. Israel has only six million people. Israel is a leader in technology. Many of the most important Intel chips have been pioneered in Israel. Many of the most important biotech companies, like um, Given Imaging with the pill cam with a camera, come out of Israel. So Israel is a technology powerhouse. Many of the traditional military threats are really not there. The threat of an existential land invasion is gone, of a simultaneous attack from Iraq, Syria, and Egypt. Oh, we'll get it's to that. that. That's important. But how? let me go back to the, the oil. What are they finding? They're finding natural gas. Is it in shale, like we're finding in the United States? Or how? what happened? Because we, they thought it was like completely dry of oil, and they're they're very dependent, and they're very and they're very dependent on uh, you know our natural gas. You know, I, I um, mean, I mean okay, I, so I know, they they were always dependent on you know gas from Saudi Arabia. They were you know like well, we actually, are. okay. So you know, it's interesting that Israel gave up the Sinai to Egypt in the 70s as part of the Camp David mm -hmm. Accords because of the fact that Israel wants peace, even though that's a massive territory. Israel had actually discovered a fairly significant amount of oil there. So there was that big sacrifice there. Israel has always been vulnerable in terms of energy because it's a small country that did not have 
the resources before for its own energy. But so Moses, but Moses knew better because he knew there was something. Maybe there. he did. We just didn't look for the right thing. But I, I think you know a lot of times the oil that a country like Saudi Arabia or frankly Nigeria or Russia has becomes a curse. You know that it causes their economies to not properly develop. But Israel was. Um, vulnerable because it used to import oil, for example, from the Shah of Iran that was an ally. It, he was overthrown by an extremist, anti-Semitic, Nazi-like government, Khomeini, in Iran, so that they lost that source of oil. They had to depend on the Egyptians, who for a while were getting a little bit doubtful, even under Mubarak. Although, fortunately today, Israel has the best relations with uh, relationship with an Egyptian government ever. Mm -hmm. The Egyptian government is more committed to destroying Hamas than even Israel. So sometimes they push things even further than the Netanyahu administration really wants. Yes, they they kind of keep that quiet of his relationship with 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 Egypt. You know, you know it's interesting. You know, they, they seem to like Turkey, Egypt, all these. Countries. Well, not Turkey anymore. Yep. The Israel used to have a really strong relationship right. with Turkey, but today the Turkish not, government's but, hostile. But if you but yet they're not going to be doing any. If you notice, they're not sending uh, doing anything on the Palestinian front. Because, oh, no, 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 no. The yeah. Turkish government is very hostile on the Palestinian issue to yes. Israel. Oh, right. So, but but they're still staying out of it because of because of Israel has nuclear power. Well, actually, and that is one of that's, the reasons, okay, so too. As a last, a bit, as a last, a bit a, as a last, as a last recourse, hopefully it never even comes close to that, that's yes. But the hostile tenure coming from this new Islamist government in Turkey is very scary. But fortunately, the Turkish government is getting a lot of pushback from the Egyptian government, the Saudi mm -hmm. government, and the United Arab Emirates. So these countries are very, very closely aligned, mostly below the surface, although there are statements, official statements that come out of Saudi Arabia that kind of suggest these things. So we have major tensions between the government of Egypt and Turkey. The Turkish government supported the Muslim Brotherhood, which was toppled by the military. Um, we generally have to be happy about that because more radical elements of the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt inspired Hamas and even Al-Qaeda and Al-Qaeda-like groups. So now General Sisi has been very... Uh, very supportive. supportive and in fact, his, you know, it's Israel. interesting. A yeah, year a lot ago... Of people don't realize this, well, you know, but, they, yeah. but he has been But, you know, it's, it's interesting. About a year ago, the Israelis located terrorists in the Sinai, which, as I said, the Israelis gave back to Egypt because Israel wanted to have peace with the Arab world. And Israel told the Egyptian generals who had taken over, we have terrorists there. And the Egyptians were like, well, can you do something to take care of it? And Israelis said, yes, we could fire a missile into your territory. And the Egyptian general said, could you? And Israelis said, sure. So the first time in 40 years, the Israeli military fired a missile into Egyptian territory. Now, this was supposed to be kept secret, but fortunately, the leak appeared to come from the Egyptian side rather than the Israeli side, because if it came from the Israeli side, then the Egyptians would have cause for being upset with Israelis. Um, what? But Israel has a lot of trading partners that people don't realize. Israel has, Israel has China. It has um, Japan. Japan. Japan is a big it investor in Israel. Right. It, it, it also Russia. The, the United Russian States Russia and before. European Union. They, I mean, even countries like our enemy. Sometimes our enemy is our, yeah, you know, but, our enemy. Yeah, but, 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 but I have to say, you know, in, in terms of Russia, I know you wanted to point that out. Because Israel's very high tech. They don't have much to try trade mm -hmm. with Russia. Now, Israel has sold drones to Israel after the Georgia war exposed some weaknesses in the mm -hmm. Russian military, but before the world became began to realize how horrible Putin is. So the Israelis were able to sell drones. They may not be able to sell anything else militarily be to Russia because um, Russia has turned out mm -hmm. to be a major rogue state, mm -hmm. by far the most dangerous rogue state in the world. Mm -hmm. um, but Basically, you have Japanese and now even Chinese investing in Israeli technology firms. So the trade of Israel is primarily focused towards European Union, which are advanced economies, countries like Singapore. By the way, the Israeli military built the, the military of Singapore. And the guy who ruled Singapore, is now Singapore is like the fifth richest country in the world, or for something like that, looks really smart. He hired Israel to build his military in the early 60s before the Israelis became famous for having a military after the Six-Day War. Is, that is interesting. So he built the military yeah. of Singapore. It's a tiny state that's super, super rich. Those are the partners that Israel mm -hmm. really focuses in on, the high-tech countries like United States, Canada, Europe, not Russia, Russia's backwards. Um, Israel is on the brink of energy independence. Yes, I want to talk about that because I think it's important that most people think that 
Israel only has the Iron Dome. And that's what's, you know, I mean, I know you know different, but what we have in our country, we don't get, you know, our reports are coming from, you know, the other uh, TV stations. We don't get to seem to know what exactly, uh, what Israel is capable and what it has. And I want you to a little bit talk about the, oh, the missile a defense system. The Aero 3 and the a Aegis, Aegis, Aegis systems. Uh, so what we're in the other brink, than the, okay, so this other is really than the, interesting. Other than, than the Iron Dome. Yeah, the Iron Dome is only for very short range, very primitive mm -hmm. missiles. Now there was a lot of skepticism about that because some of the rockets it's working to defend against are $500. And amazingly it actually worked. Even though they're so cheap, it wasn't overwhelmed. But I'm more excited by all the rest of the missile defense system. It will be a multi-layered defense. You already have the Patriot 3 operational. People sort of know about that because it's the third version of the Patriot missiles that you saw during Desert Storm in 1990. Um, and the Arrow 3 is about to come online, and I encourage everyone to watch the promotional videos by Israel Aircraft Industries and Boeing, who are partners on this project. It, is, it has the maneuvering capability to maneuver in outer space. It's called exo-atmospheric maneuvering. So it actually separate in any of the space vehicle, and it has maneuvering rockets. It gets updated telemetry on what would unfortunately likely be, although they would be foolish to do it, fortunately, uh, Iranian missile, incoming missile. So the, they, the Aero 3 intercepts in outer space. Now, how did they get this? Did the United States basically fund it? They funded it together, the, the, or the, Boeing, or well, no, what was but, the situation? But a lot of it was funded by the United States, but much, if probably most of the technology is indigenous to, to Israel, Israel's very advanced rockets. I want to throw in, you know, the, the Israeli missile defense system will work best because of the fact that it's integrated with American systems. So the Arrow 3 will be able to launch earlier because it doesn't have to depend on the radar systems in Israel. It's plugged into the global system of satellites that the United States has. Hopefully the Russians never strike at it, although unfortunately there's a risk at it. But the first strike will be hopefully Aegis destroyers in the Persian Gulf. And it will do what's called a boost phase intercept, trying to shoot down the missile when it's launch phase at its lowest point. It takes a while for that missile to pick up speed and become even hypersonic. So, be so before the missile can get to... Outer uh, space. So the first strike may very well be the Aegis, and our Aegis system is basically already ready to do that. The Aero 3 is going to be operational in about a year or two, and of course, you know, it'll take time as, you know, additional Aero 3 batteries. Now the Aero 2 is, yeah. by the way, still operational. So after the Aero 3 has its shot or two, then the Aero 2 is that, has... Are they both together now in Israel? Aero, Aero 2, 2 is, is operational. So the Arrow okay. 2 probably can sh shoot down missiles from Iran anyway, and then the Patriot 3 has the last shot at it. But, you know, the Center for Strategic and International Studies, I have to point out, always point out, said that, it, God forbid, Iran fired nuclear missiles at Israel, and they were foolish enough. The Israeli retaliation they predicted would cost 20 million Iranian lives in a week. And my point is Israel has... The, the belief is a massive nuclear deterrent. And unless Iran is convinced that everyone's wrong, now I realize it's talking not... About, talking about Iran, and then we'll go back to Israel, what is their capabilities? What do you think? Uh, do you think they'll be ready to, to launch their nuclear? Because they say their nuclear is just for energy, and we know it's not just for well, energy. Okay, so... So what, what do you think? Do you think they'll be ready in less than a year? They're, 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 and with all the sanctions no, being no, no, uh, no, 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 uplifted? I mean... The, the thing is, we're talking about very incipient, very crude capabilities, both in terms of met missiles, warheads, the ability to miniaturize the warheads, put them on missiles, um, and they're facing annihilation if they attack Israel. So, a big so are you saying they're, they're in primitive form, or they're much more advanced? No, no. I mean, this is a very, very limited nuclear program, extremely limited. I mean, so... It needs to be stopped. Then if it was but very it, limited, why no, is I mean, well, Israel so worried but, no, about it? Iran, well, let me explain. First of all, Iran, for the last 30 years, has been the, the greatest state sponsor of terrorism. They took over from the KGB. It used to be the KGB, but they actually quickly overtook the Soviets as a major sponsor. And he sponsored the most murderous terrorists in Israel. All the suicide bombings basically have been sponsored by the Iranians. But the greater danger from Iranian nuclear weapons is the ar nuclear arms race it could trigger. The Saudis are already pretty openly saying that they will seek aggressively nuclear weapons if that happens, which creates kind of a domino. Then, then when you say that, how could they seek it? Did they, did they, they can buy them from Pakistan, or oh. they try to hire scientists. Saudi Arabia has a lot 
of, of money. Yeah. Saudi Arabia already has missiles. And then if one of these countries fall into the hands of crazy people, and Iran, yes, is in the hands of crazy people, I just don't want people to panic and think that we're one year from them firing nuclear missiles at Israel. As, as Nazi-like as they are, that, that, that's probably suicide. The Israel's rocket capability to launch a warhead in anywhere in the world is absolutely proven. I will technically have to say that Israel's massive nuclear arsenal is not absolutely proven, but all the experts believe it's one of the largest in the world and in some ways rivals the size of the British nuclear arsenal. Not quite with the same. They never talk about it. It's like they. Well, no, never I mean, hear no, them. but, but, know, but they, they, they they Israel like has. It's, Israel, it's almost like they, it doesn't exist. They well, never say well, anything about no, it. No, because Israel doesn't want to ever have to use these, but mm -hmm. um, it's now a strategic deterrent. Back in the days, which are fortunately gone, where Israel could have conceivably been overwhelmed by Arab armies massively invading, and that was also an existential threat, Israel probably had tactical nuclear warheads, lower yield, optimized to, mm -hmm. to fight soldiers, and there's even claims that they had very sophisticated neutron bombs, which are also called um, enhanced radiation. It's kind of complicated, but the kind of stuff that doesn't leave a lot of fallout, which stop tanks literally in their tracks. Um, today, it's a strategic deterrent. The main WMD threat to Israel was Syria's nerve gas. Israeli intelligence believes, for his own selfish interests, Assad actually gave up the vast majority of that. That was believed that it could so kill, eight, so that could have killed 800,000 Israelis. So the Israelis. nerve gas is no longer... It basically does not appear to be, thank God. That could have killed 800,000 Israelis. Did go, where did it go? The U.S. destroyed it. It was a deal brokered by Putin, but I don't give Putin much credit. I think Assad used Putin to get rid of weapons that were so dangerous that this psychopath knew that he couldn't handle it, and it was became more of a well, liability there, to him. Yeah, because than, it would go to Russia too. I mean, it would. No, no, Russia. Russia, unfortunately. No, I, I mean, mean, if they, if they, it got out of hand, it, it could. It, it, it's they they've historically ended up gassing more people in embarrassing ways. Do you like, think Assad really did it? Because there's, they say that the it, it really Assad really didn't do it. Assad claims he didn't do it. No, he no, but, but he the, gave it over to, to the U.S. Navy, and there was involvement with the Italians. But we were the ones who actually destroyed it. No, he said the terrorists. Remember, Assad said oh. the terrorists. His ter the terrorists here's really the did thing. it. He, so he he's never a, he's claimed a that he did it. No, he's a psychopath. We got so many psychopaths. No, no, no. It's but, running but, governments. Well, well, military okay. dictatorships have yeah. that adverse selection. I actually met a scholar who studies it, the military dictatorship, the psychopaths rise to the top. And, you know, his brother died driving 100 miles per hour in, in Beirut. That's exactly the reckless behavior of a psychopath and many things. And they'll probably kill him because he's murdered so many children. He's a psychopath that does not mind murdering children, but he knew that if he killed them with sarin gas or BX, it would trigger a reaction. So it is very likely that they had thought that they would only kill three people and scare people. They killed a thousand mm -hmm. civilians in the neighborhood they wanted to terrorize and massacre people, mm -hmm. but they forgot to even, supposedly I've read accounts, tell their Hezbollah allies to even wear gas masks. Mm -hmm. They badly underestimated it. U.S. came very close to bombing them. And if anyone used those missiles against Israel and Israel thought it was Syrian government, the Israelis might strike back with nuclear forces. So. I, I think my, my gut reaction is he got rid of it because he thought it was more of a liability. The Israeli intelligence apparently believes that there's a residual amount, which is you, probably you for a last never, resort. You know what I never understood, Michael? That they had searing the ass, and Assad has a family of his own there. I mean, how foolish it is. I mean, with winds and everything else, it would get into their houses and their children. I mean, I think they were protected. I, mean, I think it was enough of a distance. I mean, it is somewhat but fragile. But winds it can't and, yeah, no, it can't travel. No, no, but the, the chemical is somewhat fragile. It can't stay in the air more than 24 hours. But, but who knows? But, but, but the, the, the residual amount of nerve gas the Syrians have is probably as a last-ditch defense, mm -hmm. should I, ISIS and other extreme Sunni groups, or any Sunni groups at this point, overcome the Syrian military, because unfortunately we're facing a likely slaughter of Alawites, who Assad uh, belongs to the Alawite group, and, 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 and unfortunately because of the hatred that Assad's murderous uh, t terrorism and atrocities has unleashed, the people who seek revenge may not only seek it against Assad's ethnicity, the Alawites, who are sort of like Shiites, but Shiites, Christians, possibly Druze, um, so that, um, you know, we, he's unleashed a really ugly dynamic that might make the Iraqi civil war and the Lebanese civil war look clean. What about, you know, we talked about, not people don't know that, could Assad be on his way out? 
No, I mean, everyone has thought that he was on his way out for two years. You just saw Gaddafi a few years ago get massacred by his own people because he, uh, he reacted with such brutality. The irony is... Because I, think, I got, No, but let me say I something. Let me right say here. something. No, there's a funny thing. Assad I'm, started his brutal, savage attacks against his people right at the beginning of the Libyan like civil war or revolution, whatever you want to call it. And I think... That Assad at that point actually thought Gaddafi was winning by massacring his own people. Because Assad started all the massacres against the Sunnis at the early point of the revolution that toppled Gaddafi. And I think he saw Mubarak get thrown out because his troops didn't fire on the people. And he saw Gaddafi still in power. Mm -hmm. But then if you wait like a year or a year and a half later, Gaddafi is brutally killed. So I think, I mean, you can't feel sorry for Assad because regardless, he doesn't mind killing people. I mean, so he's a monster. So, you know, his brutal death is... Well, what about, I just got, uh, on this uh, thing that I got right from, uh, that I got from the uh, U.S. News, it says, top unit to meet with Syrians leading opposition group, signaling Assad's days are number. Member of the Sy Syrian opposition are headed to Moscow for high-level talks with Russian officials, a sign that Assad's era is nearing to I an mean, end. Actually, so what is that all about? No, I mean, okay, so with Assad, um, there was more, like it was assumed like a year or two ago. See, this is from 2012 that he was on his way out. He's mm -hmm. out survived and he survived long enough. We, we, we still won't be shocked if he's toppled tomorrow, but he survived enough that it's not the guarantee that we thought. Now, the significance of him being toppled is he's the key conduit between Iran and Hezbollah. It's not clear that Hezbollah or even Hamas could function without Assad, and that's a beautiful thing. Now, Hamas, a couple years ago, with the Muslim Brotherhood running Egypt, and with a lot of money from Qatar, felt free to attack their old ally because Hamas is actually Sunni, and Assad was massacring Sunnis. That was their mistake, because then a new Egyptian government came, and Qatar's money is not very good when the Egyptians control the border and they can cut off Hamas entirely. But and now, it, now, the, now, by the way, the Iranians are pissed off at, at, um, at, at Hamas for, for condemning Assad. So, but anyway, Hezbollah depends But wasn't on, Putin good friends with Assad, and he was protecting him for a while? What's going on? No, says, Putin, Putin is, appears to be committed to protecting Assad, and he acts as the veto on the Security Council. Um, but compared, because the resources that Russia can bring to bear in the Middle East until the day, God forbid, they start firing nuclear missiles places is very, very limited. So it is kind of limited to selling weapons that Syria doesn't always have the money to pay for because the, the economy is completely destroyed, and also their veto on the Security Council. So I don't think... So what happened to their buddy-buddy relationship? It's still there, but, but there is a huge limit to what Russia can do for Assad, so that support is symbolic. They do not want their ally to be removed, like Milosevic. It's a symbolic thing. They don't have such a huge stake. People talk about the naval base in Syria, but um, this gets complicated. Who can, who can replace Assad if Assad does go down or he what, resigns what, what we really, or he's okay, forced to resign? What, what we really, no, what we're really seeing is Syria and Iraq increasingly look like failed states. The economy of Egypt is very fragile, so Egypt could potentially topple too. The Egyptian government has an uneasy relationship with the U.S. government because Obama sort of supported the democratic process that led to the Muslim Brotherhood. But it's important, in fairness, to understand that Republican senators have also been very critical of the repressive um, methods of the current Egyptian military government and their non-democratic ways. So democracy is shared among most Democrats and Republican politicians involved in foreign policy because it's a core American value. But the Israeli government is very close to the Egyptian government, closer than ever. Um, so remember that Libya used to be viewed as a threat to Israel. Libya is a failed state and no longer has any military projection ability. There's no Iraqi army. And in effect, there is no Syrian army that could hold up against Israelis. So most of the military threats, that leaves basically Egypt. Egypt is dependent on American military equipment, whether it likes it or not. And it's one of many reasons that even Egypt couldn't really sustain a military offensive. And at the point where they quickly agreed to the Israelis firing a missile to kill 
terrorists in their own territory, they're not very confident about their military capabilities. You know, while we have just a few minutes, what are, what are your thoughts on uh, what's going to go, what's going to happen in Israel? Are they going to becoming a two-part state? Are they not going to become a two-part state? And if they did become a two-part state, who would take over the, the Palestinians? Hamas? It looks like Hamas would be the well, government. Hamas controls so, Gaza, so, and they're um, having trouble with so, that. Um, so um, in basically, um, the situation's complicated. Um, there is a historic dispute that basically emerged when all the Jews were kicked out of East Jerusalem and the West Bank. So you, don't, so you don't think it's about settlements? They it's just not. use that no, as a, a, you know, No, just as a scapegoat. A scapegoat, and Especially right. not for the Middle East as a whole. But in terms of internal security and stability, the Israelis have to figure out a way for the Arabs who are citizens of Israel and then the Arabs in the territories that are not formally part of Israel that are up for negotiations, which include East Jerusalem, which was annexed, and West Bank, which was not, they need to worry about the economic and social um, uh, situation there. And so providing... You, you, had, you had a very good idea. You told me right before the show started, you thought that the best thing for uh, Palestinians to get that economic, they can get some economy going, would to be to develop the Sinai. Absolutely. That would be for Gaza and for the West Bank and even possibly East Jerusalem, closer, stronger ties with Jordan. Jordan is mostly Palestinian. Um, this will probably be too complicated to explain in a minute, but don't fall into the trap like nobody likes a Palestinians, Jordanians don't like the Palestinians. Well, truth be told, in the Arab world, nobody likes anyone else. But that will eventually they'll figure <laughs> it out. But just ge uh, geographically, the West Bank was part of Jordan and it's adjacent. So, and the West Bank is kind of too small to be its own state. And because of security issues, the Palestinians can't work in Israel as freely as they did. And that might that period might not return. Jordan is a close American ally, basically always has. Hopefully, that stability will remain. Um, the Palestinians have been used as cannon fodder to kill the only democratic state in the Middle East, the Jewish state. So you had this anti-Semitic project, and the Palestinians were used as cannon fodder and as an excuse. But in order to prevent terrorism, it may not be enough just to destroy the sponsors of terrorism, which is the Syrian government, Hezbollah, and the Iranian government, but also to give economic prosperity to the Palestinians. Mm -hmm. Oslo offered the promise of it. Arafat betrayed Clinton and Israeli government. Arafat told George W. Bush this. Don't trust Arafat. He betrayed him. Um, There's so much betrayal in the Middle East. And, you know, we have, we're have we going down to our last minute. Mm -hmm. But we, you want to say one more thing about Israel being a foreign, being a superpower? The oh, regional militarily.